And so now these feedbacks are influencing each other. They're feeding off each other. We have warm water growing up there, releasing methane clathrates. Methane clathrates rise, release methane into the atmosphere that causes the Atlantic water to be warmer, and so on. This is what Siberian methane looked like. This is permafrost degrading and producing methane in the atmosphere. And this is what it looked like in the summer of 2010. And so there are methane vents 30 centimeters in diameter in summer of 2010. So scientists thinking they're cool go ahead and light that on fire so that we have this grand change in human consciousness I keep hearing about so that everybody suddenly will stop burning fossil fuels because people will see what we're doing. Notably, they'll see that, that, their, that their sun can light a fire. This is what scientists are all about. Look, Mom, we made a fire. Yeah, cool. So this is summer 2010. There's these methane vents and they're this big coming out of the permafrost. It's very exciting for the scientists who discovered this. And in, in summer 2011, they weren't lighting this on fire anymore because those methane vents were a kilometer across. A million-fold increase in size in a year. It's almost as if we've triggered rapid, unpredictable, and nonlinear responses. This is huge. Complete media blackout. Third self-reinforcing feedback loop reported in the Referee Journal of Children 2011 was also from the summer 2010 when a drought in the Amazon caused the lungs of the planet to be a source of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere because of rapid decomposition rather than a sink because of photosynthesis. It's actually been reported since at least 2000 in, in a paper in Nature, and there were summaries within the last year or so in two major journals. But it really got the attention of the scientific community, if not the mainstream media, when it happened in the Amazon. So, I'm putting this in with the 2011 version, but we've arguably known about it since the year 2000. And finally, peat decomposition was the fourth self-reinforcing feedback loop reported in 2011. Peat decomposes in the world's boreal forests, and it's such a fragile source of carbon that upon decomposing, it, it, it causes vapor, carbon dioxide to vapor into the atmosphere almost immediately. It's, it's like it's being burned out. Fire is just a rapid decomposition process. And so these, the, the peat is so fragile and has such a high surface area to volume ratio that when it breaks down, it's a very short period of time from solid to gaseous form. Okay, so four feedbacks in 2011 after the first being reported in 2010, and then six more in 2012. Notice two of these six are not from the Referee Journal literature. One is from NASA out of Russian forest and bog fires increasing in size, a trend that was detected later throughout the world's forests. And the last one was reported by the U.S. National Snow and Ice Data Center and the Beaufort Gyre apparently reversed course. I haven't seen any follow-up information on this, so we don't know if that's really the case. If it reversed course, it would start sucking the warm Atlantic water up instead of repelling it and pushing it back through the frame strain. But there's been no follow-up on that. I don't know if it has reverse course, so that's why I say apparently. So there's the six from 2012, and there's the six more from early 2013. I'm not going to go through them in detail. When I'm done here, I'll, I'll include a link to an oft-updated essay on my website that goes through the evidence for each of these. And, and links to all of the papers. Again, five of the six are from the Referee Journal literature, the other is from NASA, and that gets us halfway through 2013. And then let's look at the other approximately half of 2013. And then the other four, so we have 16 in 2013. So we've gone from one in 2010, three or four in 2011, 6 in 2012 and 16 in 2013, geological events are playing out in real time on the climate front. Finally, in 2014, we've observed three self reinforcing feedback loops reported in the Referee Journal literature. And so, if I'm doing the math right, that's a whole bunch. So, now what? The question is what do we do? What do, what do we do? And what do I do? The political response remains the same, according to your president, as the message is somehow we're going to ignore jobs and grow simply to address climate change. I won't go for that. 
<laughs> Priorities, baby. Jobs. Yeah, it's doing great, by the way. A Wall Street advisor pointed out less than two months ago, anonymously, that the unemployment rate in this country is not 6.6% as reported by the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Not 6.6%. It's actually 37.2%. So that jobs and growth thing, that's working out great. Well, of course. The Obama administration has known for a long time what's going on in the world. They've known about all these papers, as sure as I have. And they received the briefing at COP15 from the Alliance of Small Island States that in the summary says, in bold type, the long-term sea level corresponds to current CO2 concentration, which is 385 parts per million at the time, now it's about 400, is about 23 meters above today's level, and temperatures will be 6 degrees C or more higher. That's based on real long-term climate records, not models. So we know where we're headed based on current atmospheric concentration levels of, atmosphere, of carbon dioxide. Never mind methane. Ignore methane. This is where we're headed with respect to carbon dioxide alone. So for me, for, for, for the selective individual, what we do since clearly we can't influence governments that don't care anyway. What can we do? Well, the moral philosopher Bruce Springsteen points out that in the end, which you don't surrender, well, the world just trips away. Let's let go of the notion that we can have infinite growth on a finite planet with no consequences. Let's let go of the notion that humans are so special we can never drive ourselves to extinction, that we will never go extinct. After all, our species has been here for all of a quarter of a million years. Every species to arise has gone extinct, except for the relatively few that remain on the planet. And they'll go extinct too. Whether it's today, along with the 200 species we've driven to extinction so far, or tomorrow, or in 100 years, or in 100,000 years, all species go extinct. We make up stories to convince ourselves that we won't die, and that our species won't go extinct. But those are stories. The boss, by the way, was just quoting Zen. Zen Buddhism, let go or be dragged. Or popular culture, seize the day, carpe diem. When I present on, on college campuses, the students often point out that I'm pronouncing this incorrectly. They're having a really bad day, as in crappy diem. <laughs> My Latin was never that great. From Nietzsche lived as though the day were here, to which I would add, some words from that philosopher who preceded him by about 2,500 years. We named an oath after him in the medical community. First, do no harm. Yeah, that would be Hippocrates. Or from the Jewish poet Leon Staff, writing from the Warsaw Ghetto, even more than bread, we now need poetry in a time when it seems that it is not needed at all. I always finish with amazingly good news, because <laughs> apparently I'm sort of a bummer. <clears throat> DNA is amazing. We get to die. We get to die. If that isn't awesome, I don't know what is. You know what the odds are against any collection of DNA being here in physical form? It's astronomical. I mentioned this earlier, there's 10 to the 80th, or somewhere between 10 to the 80th and 10 to 100th atoms in the entire universe. And the odds of against having a, a below average temperature month for those 230 some months in a row, 330 some months in a row, whatever it is now, exceed the odds against plucking a single atom from the entire universe. You know what the odds are against the collection of DNA in your body coming together in physical form? Far, far exceeds that. Way more. If I believed in miracles, I'd think we all were one. We get to die. And that makes us the lucky ones. Because somehow, against those amazing odds, we came together to live. I hear all the time, you only live once. Not true. You only die once. You live every day. If you live. <clears throat> if you get out of your damn cube farm and stop doing what everybody else is doing, demonstrate your, van your humanity, you get to live every day. Evolutionary biologist Richard Dawkins points out in the teeth of these stupefying odds, it is you and I that are privileged to be here, privileged with eyes to see where we are and brains to wonder why. Not only do we get to be here, there's a bunch of other critters that get to be here too, right? Trilobites, deer, mice, rats, rodents of unusual size. Oh, wait. <laughs> <laughs> That's from a movie. But we get to, not only do we get to be here, we get to be here with sentience, with these big brains that allow us the ability and the eyes 
to see where we are and the brains to wonder why. Why am I here? The, the, the great question that permeates all of humanity. Why? It starts when they're two. Why? 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 Why is the sky blue? Huh? And so on. Because some things just are, and some things just aren't. That's the answer to that one. No, we get to ponder the question, the existential, infinite question, why am I here, and why are we here? And if that's too much for you, we've got video games. <laughs>